All right, at this time, let's quickly bring in my first guest, Tedo Peterside, CEO and President, Anam Foundation and founder of Stanbic IBTC uh, Bank. He's uh, the co-chair, Agenda 2050 Steering Committee. Hello to you, sir, and welcome to the program. Hi, Nancy. How are you, sir? Good to see you again. Welcome. <laughs> okay, can you hear me, sir? I can hear you now. Okay. Okay, now let's get started. Uh, give me your own assessment of our COVID-19 fight in the last one year. Earlier on in our uh, intro, I did say that, in fact, today, tomorrow marks it one year that we entered into a lockdown in the country. What's your own assessment of one year on in Nigeria? You'll be surprised to hear me say that I think overall in one year, we have done very well, okay. fairly well, ab above my expectations. Please, let's remember that COVID-19 came as a surprise to many nations. And please remember also that in April last year, Nigeria could barely muster 100 COVID-19 PCR tests a day. We have ramped up from there to the level now where everybody that wants, almost everybody that wants to get a COVID test can get a COVID test. We have gotten to the point where there's a vaccine, so Nigerians are being vaccinated. We have done fairly well given our healthcare challenges and limitations. Okay, why did you think we did very well? Since you said I will be surprised to hear, why did you think we did very well? Well, okay, I'll be honest. I think we also got a bit lucky, but I ultimately, if you're discussing healthcare, I look at death figures. No matter what people say about, oh, perhaps some deaths were not captured and so on, the bottom line is that it is very difficult to hide deaths. We do not have COVID health, COVID treatment centers that are overflowing. We do not have overflowing mortuaries. So perhaps we have been lucky because there's a theory that our people are a little more resistant to COVID than some other, some other countries. But a combination of the fact that we were able to, to respond, put up treatment centers, and also ramp up our, text, our, our testing ability and I, I think ensured that we had a, a fairly modest crisis so far but there's no excuse to relax because all over Africa the trend is that the second wave of COVID-19 is more is doing more damage than the first wave partly because I think some of the controls and discipline that people endured in the first wave. In the second wave, they have given up and relaxed. So we, have to, we still have to be careful because this COVID is not over. We could have a third wave as well. Yes, you're quite right because some countries are already experiencing the third wave. We see uh, lockdowns even in the UK and in some other parts of Europe. I also know that during the year, in the last one year, uh, the Anam uh, uh, Foundation COVID-19 think tank was formed and was uh, getting out some reports, which were also being sent to me. I was analyzing them uh, uh, frequently here on the program. Why did you form that? And why were we seeing the think tank coming out with reports, especially as it concerns COVID-19? Okay, I think I've explained this before, but it's good to explain it always, because I think there were, there were three major challenges that one expected every country to face with covid there was the there was the healthcare challenge which we know about there was also the the communication challenge and then the third challenge was the governance challenge i think we the, the idea of setting up a think tank in nigeria was because we were aware in advance that apart from the healthcare challenges nigeria has serious would have serious challenges with communication, with governance surrounding COVID. The countries that have done the best so far in COVID were the countries that got those three pillars right. The healthcare system was robust, but what probably equally, more, equally important, their governance was in order, and so too was their ability to communicate with the citizenry. In Nigeria, communication is a challenge, and governance is, is in some parts of the country, in some states, is near disaster. You can see that in, in some of the numbers. As of today, I mean, I mean, I mean, Kogi, Kogi State is yet to vaccinate one human being. 
but then I mean let's discuss that one later mm. <laughs> okay um, that brings me to the question of the myth that is still surrounding the existence of COVID-19 in Nigeria why do you think that many people or some people do not believe that there is COVID-19 in Nigeria, especially after you said that uh, we've seen that even all over the country, we lost some prominent personalities. I personally lost friends. I lost even friends that come here on the show due to COVID-19 in the last one year. So why do you think that that myth around the disease still exists? You know, it's when you have a new crisis on your hands, as, as where leaders show up, they communicate. One of the reasons why Germany has done very well is that Angela Merkel was communicating with her citizenry. Some German friends told me that when she made a passionate appeal and explained to the whole of Germany why she had to lock down Germany, that some of them said her speech was so fantastic, it brought tears to their eyes. Because when you are facing a crisis, leaders must show the way. Please, in Nigeria, there are some states that have done phenomenally well relatively to their resources. I will cite Kaduna State, I will cite Lagos State. But I think the point I'm making is that these myths too should be fought by leaders. So let's take the case of now of Kogi State. By the time the governor of Kogi State is out there trying to rubbish the vaccine, you will probably assume that the public explains where his state is nowhere prepared yet for vaccines. So in Nigeria, we call for devolution of powers. I'm all for devolution. I still stand by devolution and I'm in favor. But then when you devolve power, people will move at different speeds. And please, this has nothing to do with North and South. I hope I'll get a chance later on in response. Some of the states that are doing the best are in the Southwest, Lagos and Oku. Some of the states that are doing the best are in the Northeast, like Bauchi, and in the Northwest, like Jigawa, Kaduna, and also Katsina. Conversely, the states that are doing very badly are in the North Central, Southeast zone, and my own South South zone. <laughs> okay, bringing us to the question now of how do you think that we've been able to manage the spread of the virus? Because if you take a look at the numbers in recent times or in days or in weeks, you see that the numbers have been decreasing. I don't know if it's a matter of people are not going for tests anymore or that the virus uh, spread is declining in the country. What's your own assessment about that? Okay, I I'm not claiming to be a health expert, but let me tell you what I believe on account of the interactions within the and our foundation COVID-19 think tank, which includes experts, medical personnel, and all disciplines. I think all over the world, you will see that there's a lag between large social gatherings and festivity, which is followed some weeks later by a spike in infections. I suspect that the social gatherings over the festive period, Christmas, New Year, some of us were predicting come end of January, February, early March, or at least January, February, you would now see a spike in infections. Now, if I'm correct, then eventually that spike will give way, not because anything has changed so much, but because the space of social gatherings and festivity would have reduced after mid-January. So that tells us that one of the things we have to get right is to try and el eliminate or curb the incidence of social, needless social gatherings. That is why countries all over Western Europe and, and, and elsewhere in the world are hell bent, hell bent on, on lockdowns. As I speak, I don't think restaurants can open even in, in a place like London mm. for, for guests to walk in because they are worried about social gatherings. You know, and in Nigeria as well, I should add, the elite, please, this is not about about government sector, the elite have not been very responsible. Mm -hmm. I've, been, I've, been, I've been very disappointed seeing people who should know better, insisting on pursuing large social gatherings, sometimes indoors. The science is clear. The most dangerous type of social gathering is the one you have indoors. And as soon as you bring food and drinks, all masks are off. People start eating and talking. That becomes a super spreader event. So it's important that the elite show the way because this crisis is not yet over. Mm. I like the fact that you said that the, uh, the elites were not showing good examples. Now, th that brings me to the question of 
the spending that we've seen to combat this disease, at least in the last one year, we've seen public health spending. Uh, the federal government released some monies, billions of naira to Lagos State and some other states, even during uh, the year 2020. We've seen also private sector support uh, from Kakovit, for example, close to 40 billion naira was donated. What is your own view about how we've attacked this virus monetarily? You know, I'm happy by the extra spending that took place. I'm, I'm pleased with my colleagues in the private sector for standing up and donating COVID and all. But please, I look at Nigeria as a whole, as a nation. Earlier on, I mentioned Germany. You can mention Finland. Oh, okay, after COVID, we exposed the weakness in the healthcare sector. I thought we had learned some lessons and our priority as a nation our priority, be it in terms of budgetary expenditure or even borrowing, the first thing we'll focus upon is how to improve our healthcare. Because our healthcare situation we know is embarrassing, so much so that even the most senior people in our budget, from president downwards, as soon as they have a serious healthcare challenge, the first thing they do is run away from Abuja. Some run to Lagos, some run abroad. So how can we be in a country where even our federal capital does not have quality health care. I thought that would be the priority. And so if we were going to spend, let's say, $1.5 billion on something, it would be for health care revamp. Mm. To my shock and horror, I'm hearing about the priority is $1.5 billion to revamp from the refinery that, that we all know has been broken and, and would take a lot to, to, um, to repair. How do we put things like a, a broken refinery ahead, ahead of health care that we don't have? What is the thinking mechanism? What lessons have we learned from COVID? Mm. We'll come back to what lessons we have learned. If, if indeed we had learned any lesson, it's exactly one year of uh, lockdowns. Speak to me about how you think we'll handle the lockdown impact on lives and livelihoods. Because I've also listened to the science, and the science also says that there will be another pandemic in the future. I think what I've explained about lockdowns is that at the beginning, I was in favor of the lockdown. Probably an abnormally severe lockdown, not a total lockdown, because there's a trade off between lives and livelihoods in a poor country like Nigeria. You can lock down the rich and they will stay alive. If you lock down the very poor, they will die. So there, was, there had to be a trade off. But I think in terms of the, 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 the importance of lockdowns. Some of us were looking around the globe. Take a country like Ethiopia. They never even shut down air travel. So we had the benefit of being able to watch other countries and see the experience. If people in Ethiopia were flying and they were, and they were dying by the millions, I would have said, please, 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 let's not re repeat Ethiopia's mistake. But you could see if, if you were half intelligent, that people like the Ethiopians were flying up and down. Ethiopian airlines never stopped flying. All they told, told people to do was to wear masks, get onto the, onto the plane, social distancing at the airports, and they were alive and they were well. So I think at the beginning, some of us supported a severe lockdown initially because it was a fear of the unknown. We didn't know whether if you failed to lock down, you would have two million dead. But within a few weeks, it became clear by watching other poor countries that, hey, these guys didn't lock down and they're still alive. So can we please temper our lockdowns a little and make them more flexible, not to because of, of this trade-off between lives and livelihoods. That's why we started to canvas and say, look, leave this coffee. Let people go to the market. The market is open air anyway. It is not anywhere near half as dangerous as a social gathering of the elite in a, in, in a closed indoor hall. So let's not harass the, the poor people in the market arresting them for doing this or, or the other. Let's focus instead on stopping the elites who are the only ones who can afford a large indoor social gathering. Mm. That brings me to the question of uh, vaccines, the vaccines rollout now. Since uh, the vaccines uh, are out, it gives us some kind of reprieve. Some states have already started vaccinating. Our health workers are being vaccinated. Uh, what do you think about that? And how do you think that states can also key in into uh, this in terms of vaccines rollout? 
Yes, I believe, like I said earlier, that the vaccination program, people call it NCDC. But I think NCDC is not in charge of vaccinations mm -hmm. in Nigeria. They can support, like you can support, I can support, and they're important. But vaccinations in Nigeria, and they, we have a special agency for that, the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, NPHDA. Yeah, so they are the ones in charge of that. Everybody else is providing support. And I believe, I believe they announced some national priorities. And I'll be honest with you, I myself got vaccinated on 17th March in Lagos. I did not lobby anybody. I actually registered for the vaccine. I chose a date of 12th March, which was the earliest date available. Come 12th March, I didn't hear anything. I didn't disturb anybody. 12th of March passed 11, 12, 13, 14, 15th, 16th, on 16th of March. Some friends called me and said, hey, they went to my center in Victoria Island and they were vaccinating everybody above 60. So since I'm 65, I went along the following day, 17th of March. Oh. And by some strange coincidence, let me just add that, I actually came back to Nigeria because of COVID on 17th of March, 2020. So exactly one year later, just Providence, I was vaccinated in Nigeria. I knew I was never going to run abroad for vaccinations because Nigeria had made arrangements to get some vaccines. And I believe that the system here would deliver in Lagos, where I live. Mm. I think I caught something you said earlier. You said your center. What do you mean by your center? That you went to your center for vaccination? They said, when you registered at the beginning, by the way, I heard that original registration has been voided. Mm -hmm. But when you went in and registered online, you chose the state of the federation you were in. Okay. It gives okay. you a list of vaccination centers, 88. Okay. Okay. Because I live in Victoria Island, I chose the one that I thought was nearest to my house okay. and registered to, for a vaccine there for the, 12th, for the 12th of March, which ended up being on the 17th of March when I walked in there like everybody else. But please, let me, not, let me be very quick to point out that it's not only Lagos that has, that has managed to vaccinate a large number of people. At least five other states nationwide have done over 20,000 vaccines as of today. And that's impressive. And they are Bauchi State, Ogun State, Kaduna State, Igawa State, and Katsina State. Mm, OK, OK. Uh, what, what do you think about perhaps all the vaccine politics and vaccine nationalism uh, talk that has been going on as, it, as regards perhaps research and homegrown vaccine uh, production here in the country. What do you think? You've seen the politics going around in Europe, UK, and some others. The US has successfully, I think, vaccinated close to 150 uh, million people now. So what do you think about our production of homegrown vaccines? You know, if you notice, I said I, I came back to Nigeria on 17th of March last year. Exactly one year later, I got vaccinated. I don't think, and I could be wrong, but I don't think you can, you can use things like a COVID vaccine to develop a sector that has not mm. been phenomenally developed before now. So I think that the, the people that produced vaccines fastest are people who had been doing research in, 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 in vaccines generally. They were at the cutting edge. So that for me, I always assume that initially, Nigeria would rely on vaccines from AstraZeneca, which is what we're doing now, or somebody else. That does not stop us later on from building up our own ability to produce vaccines here. But you have to have in place the facilities, the 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 the, um, the, the factories or the laboratories, production points, the manpower and all. So for me, that's a longer term project. But please, I'm not trying to disparage any local people trying to do their best to produce a vaccine. They should try their best. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that for now, I think the federal government is right initially to rely on AstraZeneca vaccines. Okay, since you say you've been vaccinated, you've taken your first jab, I must ask you this question because I didn't know you've been vaccinated. Since you got vaccinated, did you feel any side effects? Because there are people that are saying they will not take any vaccine, that it kills is for Africans, to kill Africans. As a 65 year old man, what did you feel when you were given the jab? And perhaps when is your next jab gonna be taken? They told me to come back for my next jab on in mid-June, okay. and I will, I'm, I'm an obedient person and I will obey. I'll tell you that by the special grace, grace of God, when I got vaccinated, I really had no after effects whatsoever. But let me tell you something else for free. And because she might be watching, my mother is 96 years old. She was vaccinated in River State in Port Harcourt. 
I also felt no side effects. Mm. So some people have been feeling side effects, like but but they, that was always made clear in the literature. Every human being is slightly different. So the, but the fact is that I think the pleasing thing is that I've not heard of anybody's side effects that is outside of the long list of side effects that were listed. If you buy any tablet in the pharmacy and you open the leaflet, you will see a long list of possible side effects. Possible simply means that somebody somewhere on the globe has been proven to have taken that vaccine or that drug and had the following side effects. Again, I was lucky. I, have, I had no side effect whatsoever. Mm, that's quite instructive. So for those that believe that uh, the Astra vaccine is not good for Nigerians or not good for Africans, they are hearing it from you <laughs> first hand that have taken the job. Just as we conclude this program, you said recently that perhaps we are myopic. What do you mean by that? And uh, I would like you to go back to the fact which you said earlier, the lessons from COVID-19. Have we learned the, these lessons? Okay, well, when you say that I said recently that I was that we are severely myopic, mm. I think that was the last comment I made in, a, in an interview on news nights on Arise TV, when I was trying to point out that we are severely myopic in Nigeria. Myopic means to be short-sighted, short -sighted. which means you, the obvious thing in front of you, you can't see it. I've already made reference to the fact that I thought our priorities should now shift to things like healthcare, to things like um, um, education, you know, in effect to, to correct past mistakes, not to rush into things that are best, best done by the private sector and to go borrowing large sums of money to squander. Because, let me add why I said myopic in particular, fossil fuels are going out of fashion. So if Nigeria already has a Dangote refinery, I thought NNPC's priority, Nigeria's priority, would be things like healthcare. I thought NNPC's priority would be things like compressed national gas for cars. I, we also know that, we also know, look, look around you, the value, valuations of an investment bank originally, Valuations of companies like Tesla, mm -hmm. Volkswagen, you can go and check. Volkswagen, one of the largest car manufacturers, their share price in January this year, between January and March, has gone up by 50%. You know why? Because of their 100% commitment and investment to electric cars. So at a time when people are moving to things like compressed national gas, moving, moving, moving thinking about electric cars, that is when NMPC and Nigeria are going to make a massive investment with borrowed funds in fossil fuels in a country that has no healthcare, where everybody in Abuja still runs overseas for for the most, you know, slight for you know, for anything that that is remotely complicated. So this is why I say we are being myopic. Myopic in the sense that we are rushing to make investments in a, in a sector that is fading out. Mm. Well, so with what you've just said now, what do you think should happen to the four refineries we have? Since there's a Dangote refiner. Problem? No, no, sir, Nancy, no. Nancy, <laughs> I just Nancy. want to take you from what you said, sir. That because I've read your statements too. COVID. Yes. I've read your statements on the one point five billion dollars. So what do you think should happen to the refineries just by the side? I I think I think I explained that on on Arise TV. On that same road, there were always three major oil and gas projects. There was the NAFCON fertilizer plant that was sold to a core investor at, you know, to take over and put their money in it. There was the petrochemical plant that was sold to Indurama. The, the refinery in Paracord is the third. Mm. All I was saying was that the same formula that worked for Indurama and, and, you know, and also worked for the NAFCON that later on was bought by, by, by um, I think, you know, Jory. We should apply that winning formula and not commit the nation, the sovereign guarantees at this time, to a needless fossil fuels investment when we should be thinking about compressed natural gas, we should be thinking about the world moving on to electric cars. Mm -hmm. As a general rule, Nigeria should be thinking about our future link to fossil fuels is doubtful. So, so I think we should be making only clever investments in fossil fuels, not foolish ones. Mm. Thank okay. you. Okay, I think we've. Um, what's the way forward? <laughs> the way forward on COVID? Yes, on COVID. on COVID. I think on COVID, I've already said that let's not kid ourselves. Even the lesson of the Spanish flu, mm. 
I have an emotional attachment to the Spanish flu because it was 1918, 18. and that's the year my father, my late father was born. Even when you look at the history of the Spanish flu, in Nigeria, the Spanish flu, in the, in the end, killed over 400,000 persons at a time when we had a much smaller population. We cannot afford to joke with COVID. Yes, the first wave, we survived it. Second wave, it looks like we're surviving it. But please, let us organize ourselves vaccinate people. So people like you, Nancy, should help us to educate those governors who are lagging behind. Because you call for the evolution. One state has done 91,000 vaccines. Another one has done zero. Why don't you turn the satellite on the laggards like Kogi State and other people? Because look, I want the whole of Nigeria to benefit from all this. I don't want to see my brothers left behind because their governor is myopic. Mm. I think you've said it all. You've said it all. People like us should, should continue to do that advocacy that Nigerians indeed should also be vaccinated and calling out those that are saying perhaps this is not real, even in the midst of death that we've seen in the last one year. Thank you very much, sir, for speaking with me today. I'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. All right. Always that enjoy the talk to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I've been speaking with Atedo Peterside, C-O-N, the president of Anam Foundation, the founder of Stambi Kai BTC Bank. We've been looking at COVID-19 in Nigeria one year on. I did say at the beginning of the program that the nation entered into a lockdown on the 30th of uh, March, 2020. So it's like exactly a year of the lockdown, not when the disease uh, came in. The disease came into the country February 27th, 2020. For those of you that are ardent watchers of this show, you would have seen that in the month of February, uh, the last, uh, on the 26th of February precisely, as well as the first week of March, March 1 to 5, I did a whole week series on COVID-19 in Nigeria. We looked at the economic impact, the lessons we've learned and all of that. In case you did not see that, those are shows you don't want to miss. Go to our YouTube channel and check them out at Moneyline with Nancy at TV. This interview definitely with Atedo Peter side would also be on YouTube so that you can watch and watch again, especially the way forward to some governors, precisely the Kogi state governor. And I know you've told me that you watch this show, you like this show. So you see that you're being called out. Zero vaccine in your state. You should do the need for. Thank you for watching our video. Please hit the subscribe button below, turn on post notification to follow all our updates.